So our very last speaker of the day is Professor Rodney Brooks of EECS. He's an emeritus and he's the alumna of CSAIL. He, uh, as many of you will recall, um, he both ran uh, the mobile robot lab and the humanoid robotics lab and was director of CSAIL. Um, and Rod has many honors um, and many interesting um, insights and projects. And I think I'll just hand it over so that you have the time you need. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank Keith for giving that thing to Stallman because on the day we moved into this building in the Wall Street Journal, he compared me to John Ashcroft for spying on him with those cards. So that got him off my back. Thank you. Um, and I've, I've never followed uh, um, um, Tom before, but I, this is a side story I've got to tell you. So in 1999, one of my sons and I were standing behind you and your dad in line for Dairy Joy on Route 17, and we talked to each other. And then a few weeks later, he brings the Boston Globe in, and he says, Pops, you know, when we were talking to Tom, you and he were both professors at MIT. Now he's a billionaire. How do you feel, Pops? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to talk about, uh, eventually, is the future of computing computing. And every time I've brought this topic up, someone gets really annoyed by it. So um, it can be you if you like, uh, Bob. But someone will get really annoyed. But first, I want to say a few things. Um, I came to, um, you know, uh, I left Stanford twice. Uh, I came first as a postdoc, with, and I was Tomas Lozano Perez's first postdoc, and that was great. Um, and then I went back to Stanford on the faculty, and I came back to MIT. And um, when I came back, uh, I was on the faculty, and the director of LCS was um, <clears throat> Michael Latuzos. This is him in 1983 when I came back. He's on the uh, Bryant Gumbel show, and he's telling Bryant Gumbel, well, Telling Bryant Gumbel on the morning show that everyone's going to have a computer in their house. And Bryant Gumbel says, and what are they going to use them for, professor? And uh, Michael says, mm, I'll probably use them for commerce to buy stuff with. And Bryant Gumbel thought he was nuts. Um, <laughs> and other director, uh, Patrick Winston, who was my director at the time, he was, he was kind. He let me do anything. Um, uh, and he didn't chastise me for being stupid. Uh, it was great. Uh, so first I had this paper on how to control robots differently than everyone else. And then I started to get a, 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 a taste for weird paper names. So planning is just a way of avoiding figuring out what to do next. And then I had one, intelligence without representation, which was you know like waving a flag in front of everyone. But notice, the, the paper was received at the AI Journal in 1987. They didn't actually publish it until 1991. It took them a long time. By that time, I had Intelligence Without Reason. And then I had Elephants Don't Play Chess. And all of these papers have many thousands of citations. So they worked out. But Patrick gave me that room. And then this one, Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, A Robot Invasion of the Solar System. And that one turned into uh, Colin Angle. Um, uh, went to JPL in uh, the summer of 1989 and started a little robot project, and that turned into Sojourner, riding on Mars. So uh, after its primary mission for seven days, its secondary mission for 28 days, there it is on Sol 72, out on Mars, running the architecture from that first paper that I mentioned. <clears throat> and then I built lots of more robots with companies, spun them out while I was here, um, cleaning robots, Military robots, robots in Iraq, Afghanistan, robots in Fukushima, um, uh, robots in factories. We've seen pictures of some of them and various things today. And now I'm doing robots for warehouses. Um, so I, 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 was, I was very grateful that Patrick let me do all those things and let me be creative. But then when I became director of the AI lab, I was really grateful for Michael DeTuzos. He, he sort of took pity on me. He thought I was a naive young person who needed help. And he gave me help, and it was great. Um, and he, he used to have a parking space right outside Tech Square, which he would drive from to go to Eek's headquarters, 
I don't know why, but he'd take me in the car with him and tell me stuff while we were driving, gave me advice on how to be a lab director. And then um, after he passed away, Victor Zhu and I, uh, with, with, with uh, Michael, Michael, Victor and I had been out raising money all around the world for both labs. And then after <coughs> Michael passed away, Victor and I really worked together, and that's where C-Sale came from. Um, so it was Michael's um, uh, mentoring of me, followed by working with Victor that led to C-Sale by joining the two labs together. Now I want to talk about the main topic of my talk. Um, I'm going to show you a picture here of a road right near where I live. It's in the Presidio in San Francisco. So you see that road there? See the white line that demarks the side of the road on the right and the actual road on the left? Do you notice something different between the road and the side of the road? There's little stones and twigs on the right of the road and none where the cars go. Did they all run away? Did they all look, oh, there's cars coming. Let me think about that. I'm going to get out of the way, and we'll hide over here. Um, no, it's probably not what they did. Um, they didn't compute how to get there. They got knocked around whenever they're in the space that tires are, and they just accumulate on the side of the road. But they don't have to think about it. They don't have to compute it. It just happens. It's a process. It's a different sort of thing. It's not computation. What about this? This is um, a Falcon 9 taking astronauts in May 2020. Um, <clears throat> You know, Elon Musk is a really smart guy, he tells me. Um, <laughs> he tells all of us. You know, why didn't he just write a, you know, does he have to build a rocket? Why didn't, why didn't he just write a computer program? That'd be easier, wouldn't it? He could just write a program. He could write it in Python and use up as much uh, carbon footprint as moving the rocket. Um, be a real complex program. Why can't he do that? Why does he have to build a rocket to get stuff into space? Well, because moving stuff from the ground into orbit is not a computational problem. It's about using energy, changing potential energy of the thing that you've got, uh, velocity, et cetera. Um, it's, it's, it's something different. It's, it's some sort of physics. Um, now, peop I've had people, when I've said this, say, yeah, but it's got computers all over those rockets. Yes, it does have computers all over those rockets. There's a lot of computation. A lot of computation went into designing the rockets, to simulating the rockets, to running the rockets. But getting the stuff into orbit is not a computational process itself. It's something different. It's a different category. What about these things? Brains. Are they computers? Well, we sort of treat them as computers. We talk about them as computers. Um, but is computation what they do? Well, we sort of think they do. We all talk that way. Um, is thinking or even just controlling a creature existing in the world a computational problem? Or is it a different category, like a rocket getting stuff into orbit is a different category? And most people in computer science or AI start to get annoyed now. No, it's computational. Yeah, you don't need no rocket engines. It must be computational. Um, is a jellyfish computational? Um, it's neurons do very different sorts of things than our neurons. Or is it just some control loops? Is a tree computational? And trees, you know, they go to where the light is. They um, send nutrients to their relatives underground. They do all sorts of stuff. But are they computers? If they are computational, where's the computation happening? Maybe it is. I don't know, actually. Uh, are these um, computers, these things pictured? Well, we sort of think, no, thinking and intelligence is computational. We don't say we're simulating intelligence with artificial intelligence. And, and, and people write books about the computational brain. Computational neuroscience. At the uh, Dartmouth conference on AI in 1956, the proposal that was written by, um, most likely it was written by John McCarthy and um, 
Uh, sorry? Claude Shannon, Claude Shannon. Yeah, I can't hear you, but yes, Claude Shannon and John McCarthy. Um, so most likely it was written by them. They introduced the word artificial intelligence in the first line. That had never appeared in print as anywhere I can find before 1955 when this was written. And they say, the study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. So a machine, yeah, that's okay, we're machines, we're meat machines, as Marvin used to like, to, used to say. If a machine can do a job, this is further down the page, if a machine can do a job, then an automatic calculator can be programmed to simulate the machine. So they're sort of saying intelligence is what automatic calculators can do. It's computational. Um, that was a, a premise right there. And by the way, um, most people don't know, uh, Claude Shannon, had, he'd, 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 back in 1950, he'd been writing programs for computer chess, but computers weren't much, so he had a lot of trouble. But he'd been working in AI for quite a while. In the period 1945 to 1965, there were four disciplines emerged simultaneously. And this is two by two here, of thinking and being versus engineering and science. And we know three of their titles pretty well, artificial intelligence, some of you may know artificial life, um, and then there's neuroscience and abiogenesis, abiotic, non-biotic genesis to make life. So how does life come from non-living material? And uh, Millikan and people were you know, having uh, spark gaps inside uh, beaker flasks full of chemicals and seeing what uh, molecules could be created you know, in the primal, primordial uh, earth. So these four disciplines arose at the same time. A lot of people involved in this uh, were here at the Research Lab for Electronics in um, McCulloch's uh, group. Uh, Minsky and McCarthy were there. Um, uh, Maturana was there. Letvin was there. Um, uh, the guy, uh, some people, a bunch of people who've since been at the Santa Fe Institute a whole bunch of people were all working together in McCulloch's group, Pitts, of course. And other areas, other places too, uh, John, um, John von Neumann was involved in, in artificial life, and he also talked about neuroscience. Um, and these little arrows show where there's at, at least one person who worked in both those areas. And three of those four areas have chosen computation as their primary metaphor or analogy or even saying what those systems do. Abiogenesis, people don't talk about as being a computational problem. Stuart Kaufman, that's who I was thinking of. I knew you'd know. Um, Stuart Kaufman was also in that group. Um, so why do we think neuroscience, artificial intelligence, artificial life are computational? Why do we think they're different from uh, rockets, which are not computational? Is there no natural kind other than computation? And computation is a funny thing, you know. Um, uh, so computer programs help you design and understand rockets and space flight, but the simulations don't get you into orbit. Computer programs help you design and understand intelligence, but can simulations using computers or uh, get you human or animal level intelligence? Maybe you don't have to worry. Maybe, you know, the asymptote from LLMs is way below a mouse, maybe, because of some different stuff that's not there. Um, Barbara Tversky, she, uh, I'm sorry, she's a Stanford faculty, but some of them are okay. Uh, 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 she talks about how cognition proceeds and spatial thinking is the foundation of abstract thought in humans. and and. You know, the RAM model of, of uh, Aho, Hopcroft, and Ullman uses geometrically arranged places which we store tokens in. It's like being a hunter-gatherer. You go put the token in that place, and it's there later. You can go look at it again. Even though now, with pipelined machines and look ahead, et cetera, et cetera, there's no actual place, but we think about it as an actual place for the token. So our hunter-gatherer thinking about place and relationships place and relationships comes from our place cells and our grid cells. 
and we reuse structures in our hippocampus and our entorhinal cortex for abstract reasoning. In fact, O'Keefe, Moser, and Moser won the 2014 Nobel Prize for uh, uh, the exploration of those cells, the place cells in the hippocampus and the grid cells in the uh, cortex for how we reason about things. So computing is really close to how we think about mechanisms abstractly. In fact, Turing, what was Turing doing with this paper? Was he trying to invent computation? No, he was trying to score a cheap shot against David Hilbert. David Hilbert had uh, published not his original set of problems, but another set of problems about whether there was a, um, a way to um, sort of mechanize mathematics which was consistent. What are the three? Consi uh, co consistent, complete, and decidable. And um, uh, Gödel had already got rid of completeness and consistency. So there was only one left for him. And he'd heard about this from a lecture by Max Newman, at, uh, who was his advisor at, at, at Cambridge, who talked about a mechanical process. Is there a mechanical process? So Turing wanted to show a mechanical process that could do anything but wasn't decidable. He had to make it really good, but not good enough to be decidable. Um, and he modeled it after a person doing computations, computing numbers with paper. And he said really weird stuff, like the justification for having a finite number of states in the machine is because human memory is necessarily limited. Hmm. OK, so our notion that what drives intelligence or animals in general is based on how people compute numbers and the way they do it. And he says uh, again and again throughout this paper that he fundamentally appeals to intuition, that he's got a good enough machine to do anything machines could do, and he's going to show they can't decide stuff. But he uses intuition. And Minsky, in 1967, this beautiful book, Computation, Finite and Infinite Machines. Did you read that, Bob, when you were his student? It's a beautiful book, just crisp mathematics. But you can tell Marvin wrote it. Because um, right, right in the introduction, page six, he says, uh, the reader who finds himself in strong disagreement, either intellectually or more likely emotionally, with what I'm about to say, um, should just not worry about it. Um, <laughs> but he says, the abstract idea of machine, for example, an adding machine, is a specification for how a physical object ought to work. Um, the gears of a digit wheel adder could be metal, wood, or plastic. So it's abstracted away from the physicality, and it does computation in this non-physical you know, thought realm, because it doesn't matter how it's actually implemented. Um, and he says, computers are the kinds of machines that can be built from a finite number of simple parts. Simple parts meaning there's a very straightforward cause and effect. It's not like minimization of energy in a drum that you just beat. You know, it doesn't have to know, you know, to simulate, you, you know, need to have, know about Bessel functions and stuff. It's not something like that. It's simple, this, this moves that, that thing is there, that thing moves. Um, any process which could naturally be called an effective procedure can be realized by a Turing machine, he says. Those Turing machines are it. Um, he says that by intuition. It's not actually a proof that it's true. Uh, Knuth, 1968, Fundamental Algorithms. Um, he defines algorithms at the start of volume one. Um, algorithms must have finiteness, definiteness, input, output, and effectiveness. And then he defines what he means by effectiveness. All the operations to be performed in the algorithm must be sufficiently base that they can in principle be done exactly and in a finite length of time by a man using pencil and paper. And he has his counterexample. He says, because at this point we didn't know, there was no proof of Fermat's last theorem. He said, if the step involves proving or disproving Fermat's last theorem, you can't use that as a step in an algorithm because it's not 
you know, guaranteed to be doable in a finite amount of time. So computation is made up of the stuff that you do with pencil and paper, your finite memory. <sighs> clearly, he says his, definition, says his definition is clearly effective, and experience shows that it's also powerful enough to do anything that we can do by hand. So computation is stuff that people can do by hand with pencil and paper, as Turing said. That's his intuition. Hopcroft and Norman, 1969. We're somewhat vague in our definition of a procedure. Um, this strengthens our belief that the Turing machine is general enough to encompass the intuitive notion of a procedure. So they're all dancing around. Um, this is in your time, Bob. You were alive. You were doing stuff. You were thinking. <laughs> but they didn't. They were sort of dancing around. You know. Oh, you disagreed with all. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a Turing Prize winner for you. <laughs> um, congratulations on that, by the way, Bob. Uh, so, um, and, and by the way, this is this is uh, the thing I've discovered recently. When you get a book, read the preface. The preface is where everyone talks about their doubts. You know, once they start the main part of the book, this is this, this follows from that, blah, 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 blah. I'm really smart. But in the preface, everyone admits to all the stuff they don't really know about. Um, so we've come to accept Turing computation, that sort of steps, as what computation is, that there's nothing more to it. And then we've also, at the same time, starting in the 50s, decided that computation is what happens in people's head, that there's no rocket engines in there, or nothing else that's not computational. And I think that's an open question. Um, so is the future of computation computation? Well, the future of computation, you know, at the moment, certainly seems to be driven by AI and will continue pushing on it. My belief is it's not going to happen quickly. It's at least 300 years away before we get human. That, that's, a, that's an exact number, actually. It's exactly 300 years away. Um, uh, the human level computation. You know, McCulloch, who had all these acolytes around him, uh, um, he uh, and Walter Pitts, in their 1943 paper, tried to turn brains into simple computations, if you like, or subcomputations. He tried to turn them into um, disjunctions and conjunctions. This was 1943. It was 1938 when Claude Shannon had written his master's thesis here at MIT, inventing the AND gate and the OR gate. They, they hadn't been invented yet. You know, we were using relays, and you didn't think of them as AND gates and OR gates, the way those circuits worked. But so they, they tried to turn neurons into um, logical little pieces. The only three references were the syntax of, of, of formal languages. Um, and Hilbert's earlier uh, uh, questions about the uh, mechanical mechanism um, and Whitehead and Russell. So McCulloch, very early on, set the stage for people thinking about neurons as simple computational elements. In fact, if you look at um, von Neumann's um, architecture for what was the computer he built after, after the uh, University of Pennsylvania computers? Uh, what was it? No, after the ENIAC. The one after the ENIAC, he designed this. Sorry? No, it wasn't Johnny. It had, had another name. It was a hundred some page thing. And he's got one reference in there. The only reference is to this paper. And he, and he calls, the, uh, calls the, the organs of thought other parts of the uh, Computer. I can I can give anyone the reference uh, later. So people have tried to turn brains into these simple computation-like elements from the earliest days with no real justification for it. And I've been worrying about this stuff for a long time. This is a paper that I wrote in 2001 in uh, Nature. It was volume 409, page 409. I call it my Beach Boys paper. Um, and it's about artificial life and artificial intelligence. And these are the, type, the, subsection, the section headings and the subsection headings saying that more power has just led us 
push through with computation as the main thing, but there are problems with that. Um, could there be new developments? Do we have incorrect parameters in our models that we're not really getting general artificial intelligence or general artificial life yet? Do our models lack complexity? Is there a lack of computing power? Models lack unimagined features? Or is there new stuff? And, and um, we're gonna get to, um, Keith, we're gonna get to your point in a second. Get, be ready. Okay, <laughs> had his eyes shut. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting real close to it. Um, and in that paper, I spent, uh, in, in that three page, I spent a whole page saying what this new, this new stuff could be like. And I say it could be, you know, just some other sort of mathematical um, notion, you know, nothing different in kind, say, to, to what, uh, what um, um, uh, Turing had said, but something different could be a mathematical notion. It could be something else, uh, something that we haven't thought of yet that's important in intelligence or important in living systems. And I did uh, call this the juice. And uh, in 2018, someone dragged me into a museum in Tokyo, and this was what was there. It's um, uh, Brooks's juice. And me with a, you know, squeezing, apparently that's me, squeezing out the juice to make things living and to make things intelligent. Um, so my, my point is I'm, I have no solutions. Um, well, I've been worried about this for a long time, but I think we are all rather accepting of the status quo just as everyone was sort of ex accepting of, um, uh, theories of, of uh, how fire came from within objects until, um, uh, even though it didn't make sense, and you know, the fire wasn't in, it wasn't the phlogiston inside, it was the oxygen outside. And it took a long time before the Lavoisiers and um, an American, uh, was British who moved to the United States, figured out that it was the oxygen that was important, the common thing in burning, not the, the, not the common flodges and stuff inside the things that burn. And I think, I think maybe uh, computation is the phlogiston theory of intelligence and life. So be careful. It could take longer to do all these things than we think. Thank you. <laughs>